Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people are respectfully advised that this video contains references to and images of people who have died. In the first module of this introduction to law, there was a video setting out the history of the law. But there's another history in Australia and another law. That history and that law arises within the traditions of Australia's First Nations people. The history can be quite hard to get a hold of. You see, I'm a non-Indigenous person and I'm a man. So there are certain stories that I'm not entitled to hear and certain things that I will never understand. Even more than that, the land which we now call Australia is home to over 500 different Indigenous clans or nations and their versions of the history of this land sometimes vary. They've been handed down by oral tradition rather than in writing, which makes them difficult for a lawyer because we love to see what's written. The stories of history do, however, start in a similar way. Once the physical earth was nothing and all that existed in the void were the ancestor spirits. And those ancestor spirits came to occupy in a way that was both dreaming and actually living, the land that we now call Australia. Their actions and the stories of their actions are reflected in the shape of the land and in the trees and animals and in the people. So there is no distinction between the dreaming ancestors and their stories and the land and the people. The land is the place where those dreamings happened and the land is shaped by those dreamtime stories and the people and birds and animals were there as a result of that dreaming. And so the land and the animals and the trees and the weather must all be respected because none of them are accidental. They are all that way because they were dreamed that way by the ancestors in the dream time. Into that story came European people. They also believed that the world had been created by a great spirit, but they had no dream time stories. They saw the land as a gift given to them by their God, a thing that could be possessed and a thing whose fundamental purpose was to sustain people. They had been told that those who followed their God were chosen and were the only ones who could go to heaven. They had experienced the European period of the Enlightenment and had developed the means to travel long distances, to tame the land to make it more productive and to kill in ways never imagined by Aboriginal people. They had encountered and tamed diseases which Aboriginal people had never previously encountered. When those two cultures came together, when those two stories and traditions came together, tragedy followed. G'day everyone, my name's Anthony Maranak and I really shouldn't be giving this lecture. I'm not an Indigenous person and everything that I'll say in this lecture represents things that I have learned in my effort to understand the law as it affects Australia's Indigenous people. I often still feel that I remain profoundly ignorant, but that's not good enough. If we want the law to reflect justice, then all of us who study the law and come to the law must seek to understand how the law affects Australia's Indigenous people. Because the sad truth is that the scales of justice are often tilted against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. A nation that prides itself on equality is often so very unequal. It needn't have been this way. I mean, ultimately, some European or Asian power was going to arrive in the lands we call Australia. Ultimately, there was going to be some sort of meeting between the Indigenous people of Australia and the Torres Strait Islands and the outside world. It turned out to be the British who arrived to settle first, but it needn't have been the tragedy it became. You see, when Lieutenant James Cook set sail in 1768 on his first journey in Her Majesty's ship Endeavour, he was instructed to seek and map the great southern land which was imagined to exist to the north of Van Diemen's Land and to the west of New Zealand. And he was instructed as follows. You are likewise to observe the genius, temper, disposition and number of the natives, if there be any, and endeavour by all proper means to cultivate a friendship and alliance with them 
making them presents of such trifles as they may value, inviting them to traffic, and showing them every kind of civility and regard. Then later, in those same instructions, Cook is directed, You are also, with the consent of the natives, to take possession of convenient situations in the country in the name of the King of Great Britain. Think about those words again for a moment. Read them like a lawyer and ignore the condescending nature of the language. It was written in the 1760s after all. What are they really telling us? Well, first they're saying, don't make presumptions about the indigenous people. Work out their genius, temper, disposition and number. Learn about indigenous people. Report back. Well, that didn't really happen though, did it? Indigenous people were presumed to be primitive. So primitive, in fact, that the land should be treated as though it was unoccupied. What a colossal, awful mistake. Second, those instructions are saying, respect the Indigenous people. Cultivate friendship and alliance. Trade with them. Be civil and show regard. Well, that didn't really happen either, did it? Can you imagine what Australia might look like today if that was truly the way it had all started out? Instead, the British did exactly what colonial powers in that part of history did. They planted a flag and claimed the lands for England. However, there was a difficulty. You see, there's an old common law rule that if you take over new lands and those lands are empty, then you bring British law with you and the laws of England become the laws of the new colony. However, if the new land already has people on it, then the laws of those people remain in place until they are gradually changed. Just the way that William the Conqueror allowed the laws of the Anglo-Saxons to remain in place even after the Norman invasion in 1066. Which makes you think, given that there were 500 different nation groups or clan groups in Australia at the time, why wasn't the colony initially bound by Aboriginal law? Well, there was a practical reason and a legal reason. The practical reason was that Indigenous history and laws were oral and passed down from the elders to the generations that followed. There was no source of law. There was no equivalent of the Watangamot and the sheriffs and the bishops which William the Conqueror found when he took over. So it was all but impossible in the formation of a penal colony for the colonists to even begin to understand the complex and subtle legal and cultural environment that they found themselves in. It also has to be said that the first colonists were hardly the cream of the English crop, even the soldiers and officers. No British officer in the late 18th century would have seen it as a feather in their cap to be banished to a remote, isolated, stinking hot outpost on the wrong side of the world. So what did they do? Well, they just pretended that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders didn't exist. There was a doctrine, a legal fiction, which proclaimed Australia to be terra nullius or empty land and so English law was imported into Australia. Australia was treated as though it was uninhabited upon European arrival. And then, sadly, the reality began to match the rhetoric. The convicts, the sailors and the soldiers who came to Australia were not the most healthy specimens of the British Empire and Aboriginal people had been isolated from the rest of the world for millennia. They had not evolved immune systems that were in any way ready for smallpox or syphilis or influenza. They had not had thousands of years of building up a tolerance to alcoholic drinks and then they were confronted with rum. Smallpox alone caused a health-based genocide among Aboriginal people. We don't know the exact numbers, but if we did, they would be heartrending. And for those Aboriginal people who survived, well, they found themselves in a curious environment because those on the interface with the colonists began to see new animals in the landscape. Animals which were easy to hunt and good to eat. And it would never have occurred to an Indigenous person that those animals could be owned any more than somebody could own a kangaroo or a wombat or a dugong. And so they did hunt these animals. And the farmers saw them simply as a pest as a predator against the flock. And so they killed Aboriginal people, men, women and children. This whole early history 
was a collective process of somehow managing to see Aboriginal people as something less than people. And I wish I could say that feeling has been completely eliminated from our society, but has it? Towards the end of the 19th century, a new policy began to emerge. Those few Indigenous people remaining were seen as being utterly incapable of looking after themselves effectively, never mind the fact that they were still dealing with human tragedy on a massive scale. Government policy was that there should be missions and reserves set aside for Aboriginal people, and that there should be government officials called some variation on protector of Aborigines. Their job, allegedly, was to look after any money that might be earned by Aboriginal people, and to attend to their welfare. In a kind of twisted way, you can almost see that there was an effort to do the right thing. I mean, at least this policy regarded Aboriginal people as people. Unfortunately, these protectors became a law unto themselves. Aboriginal people were relegated quite literally to the fringes of society. They were unable to live a traditional lifestyle and yet they were unable to participate fully in Australian society had they wished to do so. Where they had the opportunity to work, they worked for slave wages, and most of those wages were taken from them and placed in accounts referred to as Aborigines welfare funds. Records were lost, money disappeared. The equivalent of millions of current day dollars earned by Aboriginal people simply vanished. And at the same time, Aboriginal people were derided for their poverty. One key characteristic of the missions was the idea of assimilation. The idea that rather than preserving and understanding Aboriginal culture, it would be in the interests of Aboriginal people to give up their culture and become more like Europeans. This was a very enticing idea in particular for early Australian Christians, whose religious understanding was that only Christians could live good lives leading to heaven. So it was possible for those people to see themselves not as destroying an ancient culture, but as saving souls. Now you might all have your own opinion about religion and souls, but there's no doubt that an ancient culture was all but destroyed. Those missions became synonymous with the term the stolen generations. You see, Aboriginal people were taken, Aboriginal children were taken from their families and fostered with white families or kept in orphanages so that they could be assimilated. There have been attempts, very sincere attempts, to compensate those children and to recognise their stories and suffering. But let us never pretend that the damage was not done. We've tracked some distance away from the law in this discussion, haven't we? Let's bring it back to the law now. Think about this. The law itself is based on the idea that we're all part of a society and that we're all respected by that society and that the law protects us as well as placing demands upon us. We accept the restrictions of the law because they are the price we pay in order to be part of the community and in order to obtain the protections which the law provides. Now ask yourself, based on just these few observations about Indigenous Australians, whether this could be true for them. Do the institutions of society protect them, respect them, listen to them? Were they really part of society at all? I mean, weren't they killed as threats to livestock? So if Aboriginal people obtained only the most marginal benefits from Australian society, why should they be prepared to accept the rules and restrictions which came along with the law? Why would Aboriginal people respect a law which said to them, in essence, that the only way they could have value was to abandon their traditional lifestyle and assimilate. It hasn't all been a story of gloom though. One of the high points came in 1967 in a constitutional referendum. You might have heard of the 1967 referendum and if you have, there's a fair chance that what you've heard is wrong. A lot of people seem to think the referendum was about voting rights, but those had already been achieved in 1962. A lot of people seem to think the referendum was about equal rights, but it's difficult to see what that even means and how it could be accomplished by a referendum in any event. In fact, the 1967 referendum caused two changes. For the first time, Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders were to be counted in the national census, 
and the Commonwealth, which had until then been forbidden from making laws for Aboriginal people, was given that power. Given that these are fairly minor changes, what was all the fuss about, really? Well, the real thing was that these changes needed to be made by way of a referendum, which meant the Australian public had the opportunity to vote. And in some ways, the campaign became more important than the referendum. You see, it wasn't presented to the voters as being a minor administrative change. The slogan for the Yes campaign was simply, vote yes for Aborigines. The vote became a proxy for the way in which normal Australians felt about Aboriginal people. And then magic happened. The votes came in and nearly 91% of all voting Australians supported the changes. All six states supported the changes. More than any other real moment before or since, the 1967 referendum represented a moment where the broader Australian community spoke in recognition and respect for Aboriginal people. In the same year that the referendum was held, one of the giants of recent Aboriginal history was joining the Liberal Party and preparing to take the public stage. Neville Thomas Bonner, a Jagara man born near the Tweed River in southern Queensland, grew up in several places but mainly in the Aboriginal community of Woorabinda, which still exists today. He had only three years of schooling and, after he married, worked across North Queensland for a while before settling on the Aboriginal mission station at Palm Island. We need to choose words carefully there because really Palm Island was somewhere between being an Aboriginal community and an informal jail. Bonner, together with his wife and children, stayed on Palm Island from 1945 until 1960. In that year, he moved to Ipswich and began his involvement in Aboriginal affairs, joining and eventually leading an organisation for Aboriginal advancement. In 1967, he joined the Liberals, and in 1970, he was selected to take a casual Senate vacancy. He was subsequently elected in his own right and remained as a Senator until 1983. He was our first Commonwealth Indigenous parliamentarian. As a senator, Neville Bonner was somewhat curious. He was a political conservative rather than being a political radical. And this drew criticism from some people within the Aboriginal community who would have preferred to see him attacking harder. At the same time, though, he was far from a servile liberal. He was never comfortable with the discipline of party politics and was one of those rare parliamentarians who regularly crossed the floor and voted with the opposition on issues that mattered to him. In 1983, his lack of party discipline was most likely one of the reasons he lost his pre-selection in the Liberal Party. He ran as an independent and very nearly won. After leaving the Parliament, he was awarded the Order of the British Empire and appointed to the board of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. He was active in a number of roles on behalf of Aboriginal people, from high-profile land council roles to grassroots roles, helping the court in Sherberg deal with young Aboriginal offenders. Finally, in 1998, he was a member of the Constitutional Convention discussing the proposed republic as a monarchist. Neville Bonner died in 1999 and was given a state funeral broadcast live on TV. He was not merely a giant of Aboriginal history, he was a giant of our national history. The 1960s also saw important developments in the area of land rights. More than any other issue, the land rights issue seems to show the sharp differences in cultural attitudes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. For non-Indigenous Australians, land is something that can be owned. It can belong to a person or to the government, and the government through the system of land registration can divide pieces of land up and attach rights of ownership and possession to them. Well, for Aboriginal Australians, this is like saying that you can own sunlight or that you can own the sound of the ocean crashing against a cliff. Aboriginal people are closely associated with their lands and they're part of the stories of those lands. So in that sense, the lands are the lands of the Aboriginal people. But when non-Aboriginal people see this in terms of Aboriginal ownership of land, well, they miss the point completely. For Aboriginal people, land rights is not about owning land. 
but rather about restoring the relationship between themselves and the land, which has existed since the dream time. The land rights movement in its modern sense really began in 1963, when Aboriginal people presented a petition to the Commonwealth Parliament. You'll remember from our history video that people have been presenting petitions to the Parliament for centuries. Well, the Yongu people presented their petition on pieces of bark. One of the petitions, known as the Yakala Bark Petitions, is still on display at the entrance to the Great Hall of Parliament House in Canberra. However, the petitions did not result in the restoration of land to Aboriginal people. Neither did a couple of early court cases. The first sign of movement came after an incident in 1966 called the Wave Hill Walk-Off, a strike of Aboriginal workers led by Vincent Lingiari. It started about working conditions, but the real issue was that the Gurindji people found it odd to be treated as servants on what was, after all, their traditional land. It took a few years, but ultimately in 1972, Prime Minister Gough Whitlam famously passed a handful of sand to Vincent Lingiari, symbolising the return of the land to the Gurindji people. Almost all of the Northern Territory, including the Gurindji lands, are now within the federal electorate of Lingiari. The approach to land rights, though, was halting and piecemeal. The handover of lands to the Gurindji people was not the start of large-scale handovers of traditional lands. That took another 20 years, and a man named Eddie Mabo. The land rights issue was fundamentally changed in the High Court as a result of two High Court decisions, Mabo and Queensland number no. 2, and the Wick Peoples and Queensland four years later. In the first of these cases, a group of men from the Merriam people of the Murray Islands, spearheaded by Mr. M Mr. Eddie Marbo, sought to establish that they were the proper owners of their traditional lands. The High Court took the quite obvious view that terra nullius was not true and had never been true. But this left them with a further difficult question to consider. Indigenous people didn't have a system of land title which would fit neatly with the Queensland system. And the traditional view had been that when Australia was settled, the Crown took superior title over all land. So what should be the legal nature of Indigenous ownership? The High Court invented the notion of native title, a form of land ownership which pre-existed before European arrival and which was not extinguished by European settlement. It's important to understand why I use the word settlement here. In those older international law terms, if European people had invaded Australia and taken Australia by conquest, then there is no doubt native title would have been extinguished. Native title remained because Australia was, in legal terms, settled. In using that term, I don't for one moment seek to diminish the experience of Aboriginal people who suddenly found their lands taken by heavily armed outsiders. From the personal perspective of Indigenous Australians, as opposed to a legal perspective, I can certainly understand why invasion seems like the only appropriate word. The High Court did, however, say that native title could be extinguished, most obviously by a grant of freehold land, or by a land use whose nature was inconsistent with native title. The Parliament then followed the Mabo decision with the Native Title Act, which provided a mechanism for Indigenous people to claim title to their lands. All of this led to the second major case, which was brought by the Wick peoples. They argued that a pastoral lease over their land should not have been enough to extinguish their native title. After all, nothing much changed on the land other than some graziers having the right to run cattle. This was a really important question because massive areas of inland Australia were covered by these pastoral leases. The High Court found that the Wick people were right and that pastoral leases themselves did not extinguish native title. Policy debate and legal debates are still ongoing about native title and one suspects they have a long way to go. However, it benefits justice for all Australians that we have now recognised that Australia was not terra nullius, that all our country was once Aboriginal land, and that much of it still is. It is a fact, an undeniable fact,
that Aboriginal people in Australia represent one of the most incarcerated peoples in the world, if not the most incarcerated. Aboriginal people make up more than a quarter of our prison population, but less than 3% of our national population. This statistic is only emblematic of a wider problem. The statistics are hard to find, but it seems inevitable that Aboriginal people are arrested orders of magnitude more often than non-Aboriginal people, that they are punished in ways not including jail far more often than non-Aboriginal people, and that they come to the attention of police far more often than non-Aboriginal people. Why is this? Well, there are only two possibilities. The first logical possibility is that Aboriginal people are somehow inherently bad, somehow inherently inclined towards crime. There's absolutely no evidence for this proposition other than the statistics themselves, and no statistics can explain themselves. So that's not the answer. The second possibility, the only realistic possibility, is that Aboriginal contact with the criminal law arises from a complex and invidious combination of things like cultural differences, economic disadvantage, educational disadvantage, substance abuse, the generational effects which resulted from the fracturing of communities by removing their children, and from the experience of racism, both as a historical and general phenomenon affecting Aboriginal people as a group, and also the experience of racism on a very personal level through personal abuse and attacks. How do we fix this? Well, one way, of course, is to address those underlying social issues. But that's a long road, and there is, to be frank, questionable commitment from significant portions of non-Aboriginal Australia. A second way, less successful but perhaps more immediately achievable, is to undertake reform of our criminal justice system. Police services now customarily have Indigenous liaison officers. There are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal support organisations. Jurisdictions have experimented with alternative types of sentence and with the limited inclusion of Aboriginal customary law in our legal system. And yet the incarceration rates continue to rise. I don't pretend to have the answer. This is a massive problem. But one thing I do know for sure is that it's a problem that won't go away and one which those of us who live in the legal profession must seek to address. The experience of Aboriginal people in our criminal law system challenges our very concepts of what justice means. We can't claim to live in a just community while such a yawning chasm exists between a group we call us and an Indigenous group we call them. During the 1980s, and very much in the context of this Indigenous overrepresentation of the prison population, Concerns began to be aired about the number of Indigenous deaths in custody. During that decade, 99 Indigenous people died in custody. A Royal Commission was, was appointed, and the Royal Commission ultimately delved very deeply into some of the underlying factors which led to Indigenous people being imprisoned, and also some of the changes which were necessary in order to keep Indigenous people safe in our prisons. The Commission made hundreds of recommendations ranging from the need for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community groups to be involved in the implementation of changes, through to very precise and practical recommendations about the sentencing of Indigenous people, the circumstances of their custody and ways in which those underlying social issues might be dealt with. Nearly 30 years on, the Royal Commission report remains a divisive issue. On the one hand, the recommendations did lead to substantial changes, particularly in terms of procedures for police and prisons. However, Aboriginal people remain incarcerated at an oppressively high rate, and the underlying social issues examined by the Commission remain as sources of disadvantage and as circumstances which promote offending. In 2008, after years of campaigning by Aboriginal people, and a decade after the release of the Bringing Them Home report into the stolen generations, the Australian Prime Minister stood up to make an apology on behalf of the entire Australian community to our Indigenous people. It's only a few minutes long. Let's watch. The Clark Government Business, notice number one, 
motion offering an apology to Australia's Indigenous peoples. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I move that. Today we honour the Indigenous peoples of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who were stolen generations, this blemished chapter in our national history. The time has now come for the nation to turn a new page. A new page in Australia's history by righting the wrongs of the past and so moving forward with confidence to the future. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. For the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. And for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. We, the Parliament of Australia, respectfully request that this apology be received in the spirit in which it is offered, as part of the healing of the nation. For the future, we take heart, resolving that this new page in the history of our great continent can now be written. We today take this first step by acknowledging the past and laying claim to a future that embraces all Australians. A future where this parliament resolves that the injustices of the past must never, never happen again. A future where we harness the determination of all Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to close the gap that lies between us and life expectancy, educational achievement and economic opportunity. A future where we embrace the possibility of new solutions to enduring problems where old approaches have failed. A future based on mutual respect, mutual resolve and mutual responsibility. A future where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country, Australia. Those were fine words and fine aspirations. However, by this time, a new policy in Indigenous relations had already sprung into action, a policy not entirely consistent with those fine words spoken in Parliament. It was known variously as the Northern Territory National Emergency Response or simply as the Intervention. This policy was supposedly developed as a response to a Northern Territory report outlining high levels of child abuse in Indigenous communities. Restrictions on alcohol and pornographic material were imposed, curfews and restrictions on movement were imposed, the army was brought in, mostly to help with building projects and the like, but their unmistakable image of authority would have been clear. Land was taken back from Aboriginal people, Welfare money was quarantined and spending restricted. The whole thing cost half a billion dollars and reached the point where even a UN special rapporteur was moved to criticise Australia on the basis of our contravention of human rights. All of this was happening while the apology itself was going on. The intervention has since been replaced by a very similar policy called Stronger Futures, so arguably all of this is still going on. One of the key difficulties of this policy was that it generally amounted to decisions made by those outside Aboriginal communities then being imposed upon Aboriginal people.
limiting or removing their own self-determination. Two other issues had continued for all these years relating to self-determination. They were the question of whether Aboriginal people should be specifically recognised in the Constitution and whether there should be a treaty with Aboriginal people, perhaps somewhat akin to the treaty between the Pake or white people in New Zealand and the Maori people. In May 2017, there was a great constitutional convention held in the foothills of Uluru in Central Australia, but bringing together elders and leaders from Indigenous communities all over the country. This convention produced a document known as the Uluru Statement from the Heart. This document began by reaffirming the relationship between Indigenous people and their lands, and by calling attention to some of the contemporary difficulties suffered by Indigenous people. It made two key recommendations. The first was that substantive constitutional change should be made, rather than the initial government proposal which had been for a symbolic recognition of Indigenous people in the Constitution's preamble. The second was for the development of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. This was to be an Indigenous voice to Parliament, a deliberative, elected Indigenous body with the purpose of advising the Parliament directly on Indigenous perspectives. There was no real detail on this proposal. The Uluru Statement was, after all, only one page long. But it was clear that this was a call for constitutional enshrinement of an adjunct body to our Parliament. It doesn't seem from public debate since the Statement that this was ever a call for First Nations to have legislative powers, but rather a unique capacity to advise. The government soon afterwards indicated that it did not support the Uluru Statement from the heart, but it's early days yet. Who knows where this proposal will go? The one word which has dominated the discussion of race relations in Australia for the last quarter century is reconciliation. In general terms, this is the idea that the ultimate goal of our racial conversation is to reach a point where tensions and conflicts between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people as groups subside and are resolved in harmony. According to Reconciliation Australia, reconciliation has five elements. The first of these is race relations, with the goal of positive two-way relationships built on trust and respect between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous Australians throughout society. The second is equality and equity, with the goal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians participating equally and equitably in all areas of life, with the goal of the distinctive individual and collective rights and cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples being universally recognised and respected, and the goal of self-determination for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The third element is institutional integrity where political, business and community institutions, and we might add legal institutions, actively support all dimensions of reconciliation. The fourth element, unity, in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories, cultures and rights are a valued and recognised part of a shared national identity, so that as a result there is national unity. And the final element is historical acceptance, in which all Australians understand and accept the wrongs of the past and their impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and in which Australia makes amends for past policies and practices and ensures that these wrongs are never repeated. While these are high and worthy goals, it would be reasonable for any fair-minded person to experience considerable frustration in relation to reconciliation. Millions of dollars are spent, millions of words are spoken, and in the end it is sometimes difficult to truly see progress in relation to these dimensions of reconciliation. And it can be difficult to imagine an Australia in which reconciliation has taken place. The question for us as lawyers is how we, in our practice of the law, can contribute to justice and reconciliation for Aboriginal people how we, through our practice of the law, can act to ensure we do not inadvertently deny Aboriginal people a voice, 
or contribute to their over-incarceration or reinforce a system with inherent disadvantages for Aboriginal people. It seems that there will never be some sweeping revolutionary moment in which we can say reconciliation occurs. Reconciliation, if it happens, will be the result of millions of individual actions by millions of individual Australians. As a legal community, we need to each carefully consider our own actions and our own chance to make even the tiniest contribution to reconciliation in Australia.